Bom Baba Dio, Bom Passaba Diva. Oh, okay. Yeah. Did a nine mile race walk this morning. Nine miles? kind of stiff. How long did that take you? Oh, an hour and 40 minutes. Okay. I, I did it at a casual pace. I like it when I do long ones. I, I, I put on my headphones and rock out. And so there, I'm not. I, I don't really push it. Yeah. Um, and I have other ones where I, I, if I push it, I can't be really listening to music because I have to concentrate on my form. But th th this was just an enjoyable. I was up early. I thought, oh, let's go for a nice long race where do you walk. No, no, yeah. I, I, I go down. I take uh, Selby down to the cathedral and then weave around on Summit, and then I go down all the way to the lakefront uh, down by the river, and then just come back to Milton. And it's 8.9 miles. <coughs> so, yeah, it's, it's fun. All right. All right, whenever you're ready. <clears throat> hey, uh, I'm listening. I'm checking levels. I'm also working on some renewed post images, so um, I might not hear something. So I'm trying to listen, and I'll take it. Well, it doesn't make any difference. Sure. I'm not expecting you to listen. All right. Um, so don't worry. Fear not. But, hey, it's good, though, what I'm hearing. So. All right. Well, you're, you're easily impressed. Cause... Hello, Aspen folks. God bless you guys. Hope that you are um, enjoying yourselves. Yes, I am wearing the same shirt uh, because I did these tapings in one session. So there you go. That's not like I only have one shirt. Do you think I'm poor or something? Is that what you think? You think I'm poor? I can't afford anything more than that. Is that what you think? See, that was an interpretation. Uh, we, we interpret these things. Oh, when you do this, it means this to me. That's what we covered in the last class. We're, we have this programming. Uh, it works on autopilot, and um, that's why we interpret the world the way we do. And it, it's an outcome of how what our parents said to us and conclusions we drew for ourselves and, and things that we saw and things that we experienced, and it just goes on autopilot, and it keeps us tripped up uh, in, in massive ways. C people limp their whole life sometimes because of a little narrow nut popping uh, in their brain. I knew a lady, she's 76 years old, um, and she died. But um, at the age of 76, she was still just heartbroken that, that her mother sent her away one summer to a relative's house because she couldn't handle her. Uh, and she was like, was I that bad that, that she had to do that? Uh, and, and that's a little narrow net. And, and she never got, and, and it stunted her in some ways. It stunted her. In some ways, she, she was still emotional like a 12-year-old. She got stuck. That event stuck her. It's just... But it sometimes affects people in more serious ways. There's a, a lady that I knew who um, had a, a terrible phobia of bugs. Uh, and I, I got to know her when she came in to, uh, for some help with this, to this friend of mine that I wrote the book Escape in the Matrix from. Um, terrible phobia of bugs and, and, and didn't know why, but it affected her life. She's a success, successful businesswoman, super intelligent, all this stuff, knew that bugs, you know, especially here in Minnesota, they aren't going to be much harm to you, whatever, but she just was terrified to the point where she couldn't walk on lawns. It affected where she went on vacation, where she didn't go on vacation, and, and all sorts of stuff. Well, it turns out, as we got to do work with her, is you trace it back far enough, and it, it went back to the time when she was nine years old, on a nice summer day, she's outside on a lawn chair and she falls asleep. She's got a five-year-old or six-year-old mischievous brother who's collecting bugs on that day. Gets them all in his jar. Spiders and, and, and June bugs and every kind of creepy crawly thing you can imagine. Centipedes. Collects them all up there. And then he sees his sister sleeping and gets a good idea. Wouldn't it be fun to scare sister by pouring all these on her? Pours them all on her head and down her blouse. She wakes up, and these bugs are crawling all over her. Her nine-year-old brain draws the conclusion, I'm going to be eaten alive by these bugs. She goes absolutely out of her brain. Well, that just gets seared in on that brain. That brain really believed that she was going to die. Uh, and now, under the right conditions, the thought of a bug, the sight of a bug, whatever, boom, that neural net, which is a, is a tiny microscopic thing, it pops. Uh, but all the meaning that she infused of that pops. And, and so for all intents and purposes, in that popping, she's a nine-year-old girl re-experiencing these bugs eating her alive. Now, she isn't aware of what she's seeing in her brain um, because the brain operates at thousands of times faster than our conscious mind can, can grasp. We, are, we only grasp seven to nine pieces of information per second. You can only be aware of seven to nine pieces of information per second. Um, if I ask you right now to be aware of the weight of your butt on the chair, um, 
Well, you had to let go of something else to feel that. Like you were, before maybe you were aware of how bad the person next to you smelled, but you forgot about that the minute you started thinking about the butt on the chair. Because you can only hold so much in your conscious mind. Well, our brain uh, processes this information thousands of times per second. Um, and, and, and so we have trouble even knowing what it is that's causing this feeling. We don't see, that, we don't see the, the virtual reality girl being in live, but she certainly feels... The, the terror of it. That's how all phobias work, all phobias. And that's how everything works. When you get mad, when a person looks at you a certain way or says something or whatever, um, it's just that neurological popping according to how you've been programmed. Now here's the thing. Uh, I, I want us to, to, to put this in perspective. I want to talk about body, soul, and spirit. A lot of people think that we're just body and soul, but the, the Bible in, in, in several places talks about body, soul, and spirit as though they're three distinct things. They're not separate things. I, I would never say that. Uh, but there's three dimensions to us, all right? And maybe that reflects the fact that we're made in the image of the triune God. Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 5 says, May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound. Not just body and soul, but spirit and soul and body. And then in Hebrews 4, it says, The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. Now look at this. Dividing soul and spirit, joint and marrow, thoughts and intentions of the heart. So the author is, is uh, I think, given here an analogy that, that the um, soul is to, uh, soul is, is, um, soul is to spirit what joints are to marrow, all right? Uh, joints are what hold a bone together, right? You, they hold your bones together. That's, what you're, that's why you're, you're a skeleton. But m marrow is what makes your bone a bone. It's the essence of who you are. So also, I submit to you that your soul is, is the, the, the held togetherness of you. It's you that is kind of at the center of all your thoughts and feelings, uh, your memories, your anticipations. It's the held together you. It's the, the experienced you, you as you experience yourself. All right? Um, you're this one personality. The word is suke. And we get the word psyche from it. And it's appropriate because... This is what takes place in the mind. You, you are an experienced, unitary self, right? We have sometimes some fragments. We're conflicted with ourselves, but basically we experience ourselves as, as one self. Um, and that's where all your thoughts happen. All your feelings happen there. Everything you feel is a result of some neurological popping in your brain. It's a result of something you're seeing, something you're hearing, something you're, you're doing something in your brain that's causing that feeling. And just being aware of that is, is important because it... If you're aware of that, it means that when you feel something, don't automatically blame something outside of you for feeling that way. Realize that you're the one creating the feeling by how you're interpreting it. Now, maybe your interpretation is correct, but maybe it's not. All right? That's why, you know, two people can be walking down the street, and, and a kid comes up and says, you are both ugly. And one person laughs, the other person cries. Same external cause, but different responses. Why? Because they've got, it has different meanings to people. One guy thinks it's funny. This other one, well, activates some kind of neural net that makes them feel insecure and they start to cry. So that's your soul. But you're more than your thoughts and your feelings. There's something more fundamental than your thoughts and your feelings, and that is spirit. Um, and the, the goal of spirit is to is to tell your soul what to think and what to feel. It's to program that organic computer of yours. You know, most people think that 99.9% that of, 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 in fact, no, this is true. 99.9% .9 of what we think is, is, is stuff that we don't even intentionally think. It's the autopilot. Your brain's always yapping. It never shuts up. It just regurgitates over and over and over again. When you're done with this lecture, try this. Go in the bathroom, shut off the lights, and just try not to think. Just listen to your brain and, and, and try, try to just keep it silent. You'll find, I guarantee you, promise you, that within three seconds, maybe four at the most, you'll hear, how am I doing? Oh, this, isn't, this isn't too hard. It, will, it, it, it won't shut up. It, will just, it just yaps. It can't help itself. And 99.9% .9 of that we don't choose. Um, it, it chose us. We inherited it from the world. And that's why, folks, there's such a gulf sometimes between what we believe is true and what we experience is true. Our experience self uh, is, is, is not in congruity with what is actually true. So here, here's how it was supposed to operate. Here's God's design. In God's design, 
God is to be Lord over us, right? He's, he's the Lord over our spirit, our core, our, our, our marrow. This is the core of who we are. He wants to be Lord over us. And then we're to be Lord over our suke, our soul, telling our, our mind what to think uh, and, and therefore what to feel. And then our soul is over our body. Our, our, our mind tells our body what to do. And by telling our body what to do, we impact the world. And that's how God's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. It gets mediated. God, over, God is Lord over our spirit, spirit over soul, soul over body, body impacts world. That's God's design. So we're designed to be from the top down and to operate from the inside out. Now, the fall changed all of that. And we surrendered our authority over to uh, God's arch enemy. And, and so what happens is now Satan's design is, is, is the way it operates is that to a large degree, Satan is the, the principality and power of this air. He uh, controls the entire world, it says in 1 John 5, 19. And so he's exercising this influence out there. And the goal is to then try to send messages to us that come through our body, through our eyes, through our ears, that get mediated to us. And they go into our brain. And then our brain tells us who we are. So it, 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 it's Lord over our spirit. So now we're defined, rather than from the top down and the inside out, now we're defined from the bottom up and the outside in. The world tells us who we are. So like, you know, for example, um, when I was, when I was uh, well, about two and a half years old, my mom had just died. Um, and I was raised by her mom, my grandma. And her mom, my grandma, was going through a terrible time, of course, because her daughter just died. And, and she was kind of an old crotchety lady, as I remember. And I was a hyperactive kid before the age of Ritalin or anything like that. And so I was always a behavior problem. And she just didn't like me. I mean, uh, we, we just didn't get along at all. And one time in prayer, I had this, this and I might talk about this later on, but I had this, the, an image came up to me that I hadn't thought about at all in my whole life. And, and it was uh, Grandma coming home uh, with, with these uh, Christmas presents. And she announces, got Christmas presents for everybody. This is the first Christmas after my mom died now. And um, so we, we all run over there to, to this bag that she's got. And I'm just jumping up and down, flapping my hands like I always did. And uh, she gives my older sister this, this really cool doll. And she gives my younger sister this real cool horse. And she gives my older brother this cool tugboat. Uh, and then it's my turn. And I'm jumping up and down. And then... I look down in the bag, and there's nothing there. And my older sister uh, says, Grandma, doesn't Greggy get a present? I look over to my grandma, and she's got this scowl on her face. All, it's, it's really mad. She goes, no, Greggy doesn't get a present because Greggy is a bad boy, and bad boys don't get presents. And I was crushed. I was just crushed. Now, see, I'm not saying my grandmother was demonic, uh, but... She was operating in this fallen world, and, and she, what she's saying and doing is the result of stuff she was programmed with. This stuff is generational, it goes back. But uh, I got a message that day. It came through my eyes and through my ears, through my body, and it told this little brain of mine that you're bad. You're bad, which then I take to be I am bad. And that becomes part of my interpretive grid. Uh, and that was repeated enough times that that became a pretty foundational framework for me. So I saw myself as fundamentally bad. And then, okay, self-fulfilling prophecy. I live that out. That's, that's, the, that's the nature of this thing. We take it in. We, 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 we take it in. It's lies. And, 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 and um, uh, it can, that we tell our spirit who we are. Uh, we, we draw conclusions about ourselves. So instead of from the top down and the inside out, it's from the bottom up and the outside in. Now, here's the situation of the believer. When you surrender to the Lord, when you turn your life over to him, um, your spirit is realigned with him, right? You're, in the core of your being, this is, this is where your disposition is. Uh, this is where your, 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 the most fundamental decisions of life are made. Here you surrender to him. It's deeper than just our conscious thought. But here you surrender to him. Uh, and so there's congruity between you and the Lord, right? Um, so you're defined from the top down, uh, inside out, to that degree. But your brain isn't automatically transformed, and the world around you isn't automatically transformed. And so you're still getting messages that, that come in from the outside and that go into your brain and that try to tell you who you are. And so the state of the, the, the redeemed person, the child of God, is that 
you're, there, there's, you're defined from the top down up to the point of soul, and from the bottom up, up to the point of soul. So the battle is with the soul. The battle is with your suke. The battle is with your mind. And that's why I say that the first plot of land we've got to take back uh, for God, if we're going to be kingdom people, is, is the space between our ears. It's so silly when people say, oh, we're going to take America back for God, or we're going to take the world back for God, when they haven't taken any of their brain back for God. This is the main battlefield here, folks. What messages do we believe? Uh, where are we going to place our credibility? What are we going to believe is true? This is why the book of Hebrews, in, in the passage I read, says the word of God is sharp to the point of being able to divide between spirit, between joint and marrow, uh, soul and spirit, and thoughts and intentions. See, the, 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 the word of God, if we believe that what God says about us is true, it's able to divide this. It can tell you what is, what is true and what is not. What is the, uh, you, you're true about your spirit, or, or what is just the, the, the fallible, fallen operating of, of your, your brain? It can tell you what, what your thoughts are and, and, and where they disagree with your intentions, because your intention is a spirit thing. That's a fundamental orientation of your life. It's your desire to be Christ-like. It's your desire to live for God. It's your desire to believe. Your thoughts, however, the Word of God can show you to the degree to which your thoughts aren't lining up with that. You are, you are in a core of your being, this kingdom, kingdom child, but your thoughts don't line up with that. Your spirit is a kingdom spirit, but your, your, your soul, your suke, isn't lining up with that. The Word of God can divide those things, can distinguish between those things. And that's what needs to happen if we're going to begin to really move in a more kingdom kind of direction. All right? This is what Paul is getting at in Romans 12, too. Love this passage. He says, don't be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Uh, the pattern of this world, he uses this Greek word, suschematizo. You'll notice that in the middle of that is the word schema. Um, or it could be translated matrix. Yeah. Don't be conformed to the matrix of this world. I would define the matrix as the total package of lies that we've been conditioned to believe. Or it's what Paul calls the flesh. It's thinking and experiencing yourself and the world as though what God says about you is not true. As though what you see is all there is. And see, we're, to make, we're not to be conformed to that pattern any longer. Not to be conformed to that package any longer. But to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Renew to go over and over again. To take the truth and to, to rehash it over and over and over again. And notice... The very fact that the Bible tells us what to think shows you that you have power over what you think. It would make no sense for, for the Scripture to tell us what to think if we didn't have power over what we think. Uh, our spirit is always over our soul. It's just that we are so not used to flexing that muscle that most people forget they have it. Um, I can't tell you the number of times I've heard, and I'm sure you've heard it too. People say, that's just the way I am. I can't help it. That's just the way I am. I just, I, I'm always that way. I've always been nervous. I've always been anxious. I've always been this way. I've always tend to judge people. I always tend... I, that's not... I never say that. I, not if it's a bad thing, because that's not just the way you are. No, that, you're giving the lies all that authority. I know it's the way you feel you are, because that, that's the nature of the matrix. Whatever we've been doing for a long time feels real. But freedom will happen when you stop believing that that's just the way you are. Um, and start giving God more credibility than you give your brain. Well, let, let, let what God says about you be true. And if your brain disagrees, then it's a lie. I don't care how true it actually feels. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then Paul says, then you'll be able to, to uh, know or to, to experience for yourself what is God's perfect will. What God's will is, that good, pleasing, and perfect will. To the degree that we're transformed by the renewing of our mind, to the degree that we get our mind, our soul, to line up with the truth of what God says about us. Um, and it's our spirit's job to tell the brain what to think. So we are going to think these thoughts. To the degree that we do that, we now begin to experience for ourselves. That Greek term there has that connotation of to experience for yourselves what is God's real will for you. And you'll know what God's real will for you is because it's always good. And it's always pleasing. All right? Uh, this is what God is, is designed for you. You'll experience that as your mind is transformed. In, in, in Ephesians chapter 4, he says something similar. Put away your former way of life, your old self, corrupt and deluded, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Or another way of saying that is clothe yourself with the new self, created according to the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. 
and put away all falsehood. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. Uh, the old is what's corrupt. It's, what's, it's what we thought was true, but is now revealed to be false uh, in, in light of what God accomplished on the cross. Be putting that off, that old self. The self that you inherited from the world, that false self that you got from mom and dad or from the babysitter who abused you or the priest who abused you or what the kids said to you or teased you on the bus or how you got beat up in the playground or how you were raped in the classroom or whatever, whatever terrible things have happened to you. It, it, it told you a message about yourself and about your worth and about who you are. When you find yourself thinking along those times, times, times in those terms, gently put it aside. And now is the time to re remember who you are in Christ. It's not like that didn't happen. It happened. But it doesn't, it, 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 don't give it authority to be Lord of your life. And you give it authority to be Lord of your life by uh, letting it define you. Whatever defines you is Lord of your life. Um, no one has the right to define you other than your maker and creator and savior, Jesus Christ. And he does it on the cross. Yeah, you're a sinner. But you're worth him dying for. And he loves you with an everlasting, perfect love. Uh, and you have unsurpassable worth and significance and uh, are perfectly secure in that. That's what's true about you. Uh, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let go of the old. Second, ten, uh, second, Chron se second Corinthians 10. You can tell I've been doing this for three hours, man. I'm sorry. My brain's starting to get, my, my, my suke is starting to get melted or something. So, but it's all right. I, I can uh, get through this. We he says, we demolish arguments, logismos, and every pretension, hupusama, that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Uh, the words he uses there, we, these arguments, logismos, can just be reasoning process, processes, and the hupsoma he's talking about, it's kind of a strange word. It means something that stands out or it's pretentious. I would say that what he's getting at is we, we want to come against every, he's clearly talking about something we do in our brain, and we want to come against every reasoning process and everything that stands out, every imagination, every, every concrete thing we see and hear, and we want to take all of that captive to Jesus Christ. And this is, he says, our warfare. It's our warfare to take that captive. To bring it under the loving lordship and the truth of, of, of Jesus Christ. The fact that we're told to do it means we can do it. Uh, we're empowered to do it because the Spirit is put in charge of... We're in charge of, our, our, of, of programming our organic computer to interface with the objective world. Philippians 4, he says, whatsoever things are, are true and whatsoever things are honorable, whatsoever things are just and pure and pleasing and commendable, think on those things. Let your mind dwell on those things. Which means, folks, that if, if, if it's not true and honorable, if it's not just, if it's not pleasing, if it's not commendable, turn your mind away from those things. Uh, you have power over what you think. And we're told here what we're, what we're to think. Um, and the brain's talking all the time. And so this is 24-7 discipleship right here. And Jesus says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Uh, knowing here is not just an intellectual knowing, it's an intimate knowing. And when you know the truth, when you are thinking the truth, believing the truth, seeing the truth, to that degree, you are set free. Uh, the old self dies away. Uh, we are no longer infusing it with authority to define who we are. And now we have um, uh, uh, the truth of Christ just liberating us. Now, here's another important aspect of, of this warfare, okay? Just listen up, because this one's really important. What I've said so far has been totally unimportant. This is where it starts to get important. Just kidding. Um, here's the thing. We don't think with information. People think we think with information, because if I ask you for something, you'll give me information. But we, that's not how we actually think. And, and this is an important point. Uh, if I ask you, what color are the walls of your bedroom? You'll tell me beige or blue or green, um, but that's not what you saw happening in your head. What happened in your head just now, if you'll do some introspection, you'll see this is the case. You just saw your bedroom. You had some way of accessing that information. You imagined your bedroom. Um, probably you imagined it the, just like it was the last time you saw it. Looking back, just as you were going out the door or something, uh, and, and if you re-experienced your bedroom. All thinking is like that. Uh, you, it, it, we replicate experiences on the inside. I say elephant, you just saw an elephant. Uh, you imagined an elephant. And we all do it a little bit differently. Uh, but uh, we replicate, represent external experiences on the inside. That's how we think. We think with our imagination. We think concretely. We give information because we can't give what we're actually doing in our head. But what we're actually doing in our head is concrete. All right? And, and uh, 
the truth is that the more concrete we see something, the, 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 the more real like it feels and the more it impacts us. So we think about representing things, re- making present again. That's what we're, re-present, re-present. You, you represented your, 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 your bedroom. You represented it. You saw it again. And the more concretely you see it, the more real it feels and the more it impacts you. Right now, if, if I think about my wife and I just think in terms of statistics, she's five foot three and she weighs blah, 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 and she's got this color hair and she's got this color eyes. If I just think about those things, you know, casually, it, it doesn't move me. Uh, that description could fit anyone. But if I close my eyes and imagine her concretely, in color, with motion, and I see her right now, she's working in the kitchen where she always likes to work, and um, she's typing things, and, and then I see her walk over and she finally looks at our dog's picture because our dog died recently and it's just got her so upset, so she loves this dog, and I see her just looking at old Max and I see her getting emotional. As, as I'm f- picturing this concretely, it starts to move me. Because my brain registers it as real because it's real like. I'm representing her, representing her. The more concrete, the more concrete your image is, the more it impacts you. This is why, I mean, advertisers know this. They're all, they want to sell you a product, and so they have concrete, vivid, memorable images. The information doesn't matter. What they want is for you to associate the product with this image. Um, and, and they're effective at doing it. Sadly, the some of the world's best neuroscientists work for advertising agents to know how can we control people's brain. And what they know is giving information is only so effective. But if you give concrete images that are vivid, boom, they'll stick in the brain. And they're powerful. And so when you think of the image, you think of the product, you think of the product, you think of the image. Uh, this is why memories are so powerful. Memories. That girl I told you about who was, had a bug phobia. Under the right conditions with the right stimulation of air into her eardrums, into her nervous system, and it gets decoded with bugs. She sees the bugs, hears, hears the word bug or whatever. She is virtually re-experiencing that trauma all over again. That memories are vivid. And the brain is trying to do you a favor. Your brain is, it just registers at a very early age. Be careful. Stay away from anything that looks like this or sounds like this or resembles this. It's trying to protect you, but see, it's locked in at a nine-year-old perspective. And, and because it's vivid, you know, it's powerful. So you experience that trauma all over again. There are people who are experiencing being raped all over again all, several times a day. Under the right triggers, boom, they all of a sudden have that panic attack. Or they have that pain, that worry, or, 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 or that self-loathing, or whatever the symptom is from that. Uh, and so here's the thing. Um, uh, we are bombarded with all these concrete images all the time from, from the commercials. I mean, all around us, we, our brain just takes this in and it just goes over this thousands of times a day. Uh, but when it comes to theology and theolo- theological truth, many people are giving nothing but abstractions. God is omnibenevolent, omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent, omni, omni, omni. And we're giving these definitions and it's just all kind of ethereal, it's abstract the incarnation, the this or that. And it's, okay, so you're being, the lies are coming to you concretely and are having an impact on you, but the truth, the truth we just have abstractly. Um, And given that we're wired to respond to what feels real, what do you think is going to win here? You see? Uh, That's why we, so many people, we believe this truth, but our life always seems to gravitate in this other direction. What we need to have happen to fight this battle is for our, the theological truth to become as concrete as the commercials that we watch, as the memories that we have, uh, to be very, very vivid and moving, because this is what's going to impact us. All of our emotions are the result of things that we're doing in our head. Your relationship with God is going to be a, a, a function of what kind of pictures you're having about God that you're doing in your head. Um, and... and uh, and so we need to be paying close attention to that. So I'm going to close here. Now, don't, don't get your hopes up. By close, I mean kind of starting to move in that direction. 20 minutes, maybe, 15. I don't know. But by giving several tips about fighting for your mind, okay? Four tips in, in, to be specific. Number one, I encourage you to submit your brain to God. And by that, I mean this. Commit to giving God's word more credibility than your thoughts and feelings. This is so important. 
Um, look at if you're in quicksand, pulling yourself up by your hair isn't going to do a lot of good because it's sinking with you. So also, if you are sinking in a bunch of lies, giving your brain credibility isn't going to help you because it's the thing that's believing the lies. If you are going to get out of quicksand, you need a source outside the quicksand that you can hang on to. And if you're going to get out of this quicksand of lies, you need a source that's got more credibility than your brain. Your brain's the problem, in other words. It can't be the solution. You've got a damaged brain. Sorry, I had to break the news to you. But you've got a da We all have got da brain damage. Why would we trust our brains? Well, I mean, we could trust it for a lot of things. But when it comes to confronting fundamental lies in our life, the brain's the problem. It's not the solution. And so we've got to be willing to give what God says about us more credibility than what, we, what, than what, we, what feels true to us and what we, what we see and experience going on in our head. All right? Submit your brain to God. The word can't function as a sword that distinguishes between intentions and thoughts, joints and marrow, soul and spirit. It can't function that way unless we're willing to give it the credibility that it deserves. Our Creator knows us better than ourselves. And we're only getting our thoughts to line up with what's true from His perspective if we are willing to grant Him that authority. Number two, I encourage you to ask the Holy Spirit to help you tear down strongholds by vividly representing and imagining the truth about God and the truth about you. The thing is, you can't fight concrete lies with just information. Information does not lead to transformation. That's why you can have people who have all the information in the world and their lives are a mess. Information does not lead to transformation. We keep on thinking that if we just had more Bible studies, learn the past a little bit better, get the original languages, that, that will transform our life. It never works! It's what you're doing concretely, vividly, imaginatively in your head. That's what sets the direction of your life. And so commit to, ask the Holy Spirit to help you tear down these strongholds, these memories, these lies, by representing the truth about God and the truth about you. And to make your theology as concrete and as impactful as your best memory or as a commercial. All right? So, for example... Imagine, envision, feel, hear, sense the truth of God, that you are a child of God. Galatians 3.26. You're a child of God. So you demolish the lie that I settle for how I've been programmed. That's just the way I am. But can you see yourself as a child of God? What do you look like? Envision that. Um, you are a new creation, 2 Corinthians 5.17. So demolish the thought that I've always been this way and I can't change. You're redeemed and reconciled to God. Romans 3 and, 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 and 2 Corinthians 5. You're redeemed reconciled to God. So demolish this idea that God's against you or that God doesn't care about you. Tear down that lie and represent what does it look like when you envision God caring about you and that you're redeemed and reconciled to him. The, the, the scripture says he'll, you, you're never separated from Christ and you'll never be abandoned by Christ. Nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. Romans 8. So demolish the thought that you're alone in life. Or whatever thought's creating that, whatever picture, whatever representation, you set that aside. And you remind yourself, and now envision this and see this, that, that he is with you, he'll never leave you or forsake you, to forsake you. And nothing, nothing in heaven, nothing in hell, nothing spoken to you, nothing done to you, not even death, can separate you from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. The truth is that you've been given a free gift of eternal life. So demolish the thought that, that, that you have no life or that death is terrifying. No, envision this. You know what? I take trips to heaven all the time. I, I, uh, I, I regularly sit down and I just envision the end of time. And when God will bring all things together under the head of Christ and bring harmony to all things, and, and I just imagine it as good as I can possibly imagine it, because I know that however good I imagine it, it's infinitely better than that. But as I see that concretely, and I usually have music going on in the background, and it's just beautiful, and sometimes I cry, and I see loved ones, and I'm up, I'm, I've seen beautiful scenes, and all is redeemed, and all is restored, and all is well, and there's no more sorrow and no more tears. And as I do that, you see, the, the, the thought of death just stops being scary. Uh, I, I've known people who've died well, and I know people who've died terrible. And the main difference is that the people who die well... They envision, they, they've, they've, they've envisioned the other time. It's not just a theoretical thing that they might live after they die. They visited there. Uh, they're not afraid because the brain registers it as real. You can believe in life after death, but if, if it doesn't feel real to you, you're going to be scared out of your kajibers when you die. I encourage you to start visiting heaven. Just go there. Ask the Spirit to show you. However good you imagine it, it's going to be a trillion times better than that. So, so, so just imagine the best thing possible. Um, and, and it takes away the fear of death. The truth is, 
You've been given grace, forgiven by God, made holy and freed from all condemnation. So demolish this thought that you are guilty or that you're unsaved or anything like that. See the truth and the truth shall set you free. What does it look like? Envision yourself when you walk around truly believing that you've been forgiven and that you are holy, that you've been freed from condemnation. Uh, can you envision that? Especially in situations where you tend to see yourself as, as, as feeling guilty. Envision that. Run that. And, and, and do it over and over again. And see, your brain, when your brain registers that as real and you st start setting aside the lies, well, that's when you begin to take it on in your life. You've got to be it, see it, think it, before you can actually begin to do it. The Bible says you've been set free from the law of sin and death and, and by the spirit of, of life of, uh, of, of Christ Jesus. Romans 8.2. So demolish this thought that you've got no power, that you're weak, that you're always going to be subjected to this, that it's got bondage on you, nothing you can do about it. Set that aside, and now you envision yourself as you are in Christ, the truth of who you are in Christ, and envision the God who has made this all true. Uh, everything that you experience about yourself that is out of sync with what the Bible says about you is true. Um, you set that aside and envision the truth. What do you look like when you know that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you? And imagine that in the situation where you feel the least empowered. You know, prayer can really be, and really should be, to a certain degree, rehearsal for life. You never get good at anything if you don't practice, right? Nothing. There's nothing significant that you're going to do that you don't have to practice for. And so you're, you're never going to be good at walking around feeling confident and, and knowing who you are in Christ and not being intimidated and not chasing after recognition and, and other idols. You're, you're never good at that until you can see yourself doing that and seeing yourself doing that in the situations where right now you're least inclined to do that. And so as a spiritual discipline, envision that because that's the true you. And as you envision that, say that. Say, this is who I truly am because this is what God says I am. It doesn't matter that you don't feel like that. Maybe there's a part of your brain that's going to be laughing at that. There will be a part of your brain because whenever you do something new, it's going to feel like you're pretending because uh, what you've identified as real has been what you've been doing in the past. When in, in fact, you're pretending when you thought you were actually incapable and incompetent and fearful and anxious and you're always going to be that way. That was pretending. What's real is what God says about you. He's not given to you a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of, of self-control. And you're seated in heavenly places above Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. And you can do all things through him. Uh, you're more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. You're filled with the spirit. You're a walking, talking temple of God. You're the bride of Christ. You're beloved. You're loved in the beloved. He's blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. And I could go on and on and on and on. Take all that truth. See it. Envision it. Envision the God who makes it all true. Uh, the God who's revealed in Jesus Christ. Uh, and see, when it's concrete, that's when it has power. Okay, so do that. Now, uh, number three. Wait, that was that number three? Well, it, it was, that was an extension of number two. This is number three. Imaginatively her situations in which you're held captive by lies. What do you look like when you respond to these situations according to truth? I just talked about that. All right, uh, um, where you, you always give in to temptation in this situation. Well, envision yourself not giving in to temptation. If you can't see it, if you can't imagine it, you're never going to be it, all right? Everything we do externally is a result of what we're doing internally. And so do dress rehearsals. Rehearse this. Um, ask the Spirit to help you. See, what do you look like when you fully embody, fully manifest the truth of who you are in Christ? And then number four, I encourage you to practice imaginative prayer, imaginative worship, and imaginative Bible reading. It's all about the imagination. I talk about this in a book called Seeing is Believing. Um, here's the thing. Um, I have known people who like get into worship and prayer and they could do it all day. They start praying and pff, they're into it or they start worshiping and they're moved by it. Their hands are raised. They cry. It's just, it, they love it. And I've met others who have trouble praying five minutes or in trouble worshiping at all. And what I found, the difference between these two groups is not that, that one group is particularly more righteous than this other group. Um, what, the difference has been that that group that gets into it has got something going on between the ears that the other group doesn't. When this group prays, they're envisioning who they're praying to and what they're praying about. And, and maybe they learned to do that, or maybe they just did it instinctively. I just, from day one, I always just did that. I assumed everyone did that. I was surprised to find out 10 years later that not everyone does that. But, but there's stuff going on. They're seeing, they're hearing, and, and it, so it feels real. Um... When I pray over people and I'm rebuking demons or something, I envision the demons and I see them running. It, it, it's, 
And maybe that, you know, I mean, it's a representation of what's real, but it is a representation. And, and, and because I'm seeing it, it feels real. And you're wired to be invested in what feels real, not in what doesn't feel real. The second group, when they worship and they pray, nothing's going on. They, they just, for whatever reason, never got the memo. Um, what's real is that there's a wall there, and I feel like I'm talking to the wall. Or more, more commonly, when you're praying, what, what's real is that you need to do groceries uh, and that you've got a birthday present you've got to buy for you know, Aunt Susie and that you have better get that toothache checked out because uh, that's getting more and more serious. That stuff's real. Uh, and so your brain says that's important. But if you're not envisioning anything, imagining anything, well, then your brain says there's more important things to do. Even though theoretically you're saying nothing's more important than talking to God, nothing's more important than worshiping God, the brain's still going to go to what it feels real, to what feels real. This is why you go to pray, and you find yourself, your brain just all of a sudden, you're talking, and all of a sudden you're thinking about something else. So you come back <coughs> and talk some more to Jesus, but then your brain, all of a sudden you're thinking about something else. St. Francis de Sales, a 16th century monk, said this. Uh, he said, the, 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 the mind is like a wild bird that will fly around all over the room while you're trying to pray until you put it into the cage of the imagination. The imagination is what focuses the mind. And so he said we should always pray with our imagination. All throughout church history you find people stressing the need for imagination. Now you also find people who, who uh, pray without that. Uh, this is called cataphatic prayer, where you pray with images. You have another tradition that's called apophatic prayer, where you try to uh, remove all images from your mind. And that works good for the mystics. You know, my mystics like to just kind of blend in with God. And, and, and people who, uh, who, who remember things mainly kinesthetically, which means in terms of what they felt. We, everyone has a dominant way of like, storing your information in your brain. Uh, about 40% of people remember what they see easiest. About another 40% remember what they hear easiest. And about 20% remember what they feel. They're kinesthetic. And feeling people don't need vivid images as much as visuals do. And so they do okay with apophatic prayer. But if you're a visual like me, man, to, to pray without images, like to think without images, you tell me not to imagine my wife when I'm thinking about her, I can't do it. I can't do it. That's what it is to think. Ideally, we should, St. Ignatius says, pray with all five senses and read the Bible with all five senses. Enter into it. Envision the world. They can holographic. He didn't use that term, but, but that's what he's getting at. So you want to use all your senses, but when you begin, it's probably easiest to start with the one that comes easiest to you, whether it's kinesthetic or, or auditory, hearing, or visual. Um, but uh, make it concrete. And, and, and so you find that it begins to feel real, and a, as you move in that, um, uh, you find yourself being more invested. It becomes no more natural to pray longer when, when it actually feels like it's real. And, and, and to worship God longer. And you'll get into it. You'll, it'll, it'll begin to move you. The final thing I'll just talk about, is mention, is just talking to Jesus. Uh, dialoguing with Jesus. Hanging out with Jesus. Going on dates with Jesus. Uh, you know, the, jo the job of the Holy Spirit is to bring us to the real Jesus. And that happens in the imagination. Uh, it's what Paul, the church tradition calls it the inner sanctum, the inner sanctuary, the place where the things of God become concrete and experiential. For so many people, they just never feel the love of God because they've never concretely envisioned the love of God. Um, when I pray, I mean, there's different ways I, I, I pray. Sometimes I envision God the Father by just imagining the stars, the expanse, the in infinitude of the cosmos. But uh, I often just hang out with Jesus. Uh, and I encourage folks to do this. Just get a room uh, where it's quiet, turn off the lights, put on the most beautiful soundtrack you know of but in the background the music is a gift from god it, just, it, it spurs our creativity melts our hearts tears down resistance uh but it should be a music that doesn't have any lyrics in it because that will get in the way of this thing and then i encourage people to just envision a place that comes natural to them um I, I, some kind of pleasant place for me it was always this kind of oval of light that was in this woods that i would run away to um it was right next to my house and and uh, this woods was and I had a stepmother who was abusive. Uh, after my mom died, my dad remarried out of convenience or out of necessity. And, and she ended up just being kind of a crazy lady. And so she got, would get abusive when she'd get mad, especially turned me towards me because I was a hyperactive problem kid. And so I'd run away to the woods. 
And there's this little opening in the woods I'd always go to, and that was like my safe place. I, I would bury treasures out there because I thought, you know, that was my space. Um, I just have some really good memories being out there. And I think God met me out there, actually. So I, when I was first beginning to do this in my late 20s, early 30s, I would always go to that oval of light, and that's where I'd meet Jesus. Now I can show up a lot of different places, but, but uh, uh, yeah, it's a place that's easy to imagine. And then just, just ask the Spirit to show you Jesus and let Jesus come to you. And, and, and at first, um, you know, it, it will feel weird if you've never done this before, okay? But that's just because you've never done this before. But uh, it's no different than me thinking about my wife right now. I, the more concrete, the better. And, and, um, and then it's important to just hear, sense, see Jesus say to you what he's already said about you in Scripture, only now he says it to you. And you see it in his eyes, and, and, and you, you see it on his lips, and you can feel it in his hug, and you can hear it in his voice. And he says your name. This is what's so impacting. Um, you know, Paul says this. This is just, this comes right out of 2 Corinthians 3. Where Paul says that, you know, the, the people, unbelievers, when they read their, the, the Bible, they've got a veil over their mind. A veil over their mind. That keeps them from seeing the glory of God. But when anyone turns to the Lord, he says, that veil is removed. And then he says, starting in verse 17, that where the Holy Spirit is, there is freedom. He's talking about a freedom to see with your mind. And he says, so then we all with unveiled faces behold the Lord as through a mirror. Because it's still mediated through our mirror, our, our mind. But he goes on to say that as we see the Lord uh, in his glory, we're transformed from one degree of glory to another. And then he goes on to say that we see the Lord, the, the glory of God shining in the face of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 4, 6. This is what he's talking about. You're able to see something you couldn't see before. And it's as we behold the beauty of God in the face of Jesus Christ that we're, that we're transformed into that image. When I... When I see Jesus rejoicing over me, it gives me joy, and I become a more joyful person. And when I see him loving me, I become more loving. And when I see his peace towards me, I become more peaceful. Uh, and and um, this is how it's what you see that, that determines what you're transformed into. Uh, and so I encourage you to just see Jesus, hear Jesus say all the stuff that he said about you in Scripture, but now he says it to you. It's great for me to know that God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. I love to know that. But that's not going to that's not going to transform me. He did that for everybody. But when I can see and hear and sense in my oval of light or on top of a mountain or wherever a beautiful scene where Jesus says to me, "Greg, I love you uh, to the point where I die for you. I died for you. I love you with an everlasting love. I will never leave you or forsake you. You're 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 eternally secure in my love." Uh, I, I, I rejoice over you. You delight my heart. Uh, you're the apple of my eye. You're, and when he starts saying that, see, my soul was made for that. That's, that, that's, the, that's what we all hunger for. Uh, and when we don't get it from him, we've got to get it from trying to be famous or smart or pretty or sexy or what have you. But when, once we get it from him, we don't need to chase after that stuff. And now you are free. Now you are free. That's freedom. You don't even need to live. Once you, once you taste of this life, you don't, you don't need to live. Uh, so you don't need to protect yourself with guns. You, you, you can live in love as Christ loved you and gave his life for, it, for you. And uh, that's when, it, when, it, when it's just beautiful. So I'll end with this. Um, I told you about my grandmother telling me I'm bad, so bad that I don't get presents. That happened, actually, when one day I had a babysitter come over. She was a student of mine at Bethel. And, and uh, uh, it was around Christmas time. And she brought Christmas presents for my two older sisters, but didn't for my son because she forgot I had a son. And... I remember, I, for, I was, I got so angry, way out of proportion. And it was the next day when I was praying that I started wondering, why did I get so angry? And that's when I remembered that that's what happened to me. And I was projecting myself onto my son. Well, what happened was, was I, I started, in times of prayer, this, this scene would come back to me. And then there was one time where it came back, and, and I, I would sometimes just cry for this little kid who really lost a lot of his innocence on that, that day when he first believed that he was so bad that, bad boy, that he doesn't get a Christmas present. You've got to be pretty bad to miss out on that. Um, and, and then uh, there was a time where I, I went through this scene again. I saw grandmother come in with a bag. And, and, and by the way, I, when I first started having this memory, I checked out with my older sister, who's nine years older than me. And I said, do you remember this event? And it actually did happen. It didn't happen exactly the way I remembered it, which is not surprising because a little brain's going to condense certain things. But this it went down pretty much as I remembered it. 
Um, so I, I see this scene where she comes in and, and she gives presents to my older sister, younger sister, or older brother. And then my sister says, Grandma, doesn't Greggy get a present? I look in the back, oh, I look up, and whereas before I would see my grandma's scowly face, I look up now, I'm jumping up and down, and I see the face of Jesus. And Jesus has got his big smile on his face. <laughs> and he rubs my curly head and he goes, of course Greggy gets a present because Greggy's a good boy. And then I look down at his bag, and whereas before I saw nothing and it broke my heart, I look down and there's this big red airplane. <laughs> this, this, this big red. And I remember as a kid asking for a red airplane and never getting it for some reason. I thought, maybe, every year I thought, okay, maybe this is the year I'll get a red airplane. And for whatever reason, I never got it. But here I look down and there's this big red airplane. And then he gives me a big hug and I give him a big hug. In subsequent times, other healings happened. You know, it, it, that was just the beginning of this healing process. But that's how we're set free. That's, that's what brings healing into our life. We've we got to redo the, our, the messages that lie to us are contained in memories. They're concrete. Information won't touch them. You, you go back into the past, invite Jesus into it, and watch how he brings healing. He, he doesn't change the past, but he changes the meaning of the past. And see, this is how we're doing warfare. We're depolluting our brains of, of lies, filling it with truth, and the more we fill it with truth, the more we're transformed into the image of truth. The more we're freed from the lies, the more we advance the kingdom of God between our ears, and then we advance the kingdom of God in our life. And that, folks, is what it is all about. I encourage you to be detectives of your mind, be aware of what's going on in your think, and be warriors that are always seeking the love of God to take every thought captive to Jesus Christ. God bless you guys. It's been a pleasure to be teaching you. Keep on thinking, keep on growing, and most importantly, keep on loving. Take care. Ushana.